Um, what I'm talking about today is uh, the centrality and significance of diurnal literature and cinema within modernism in their imbrications of temporality and the modern metropolis. And I'm focusing on the one-day novel and film in the early decades of the 20th century. In, in the second part of this talk, I'll move to something a little different, to the representations of daily time in the mass observation movement, the anthropology of ourselves, which began in Britain in the late 1930s. So the filmic city symphonies of the 20s and 30s have received a good, good deal of critical attention in, in recent decades, and, but they were in their own time. Uh, actually, just to stop for a moment, if people have nicely come forward. Can I manage without the mic? Is that all right? Yes? Okay. No? I'll shout. Um, they were in their own time received as highly significant contributions to developments in film as art, and they had a formative role in the shaping of the aesthetics and the politics of documentary film. The best known and most frequently imitated and one perhaps that most people have seen is Walter Ruttmann's Berlin Symphony of the Big City of 1926. Other city symphonies of the period include uh, Charles Schiller and Paul Strand's Manhattan, 21, Alberto Cavalcanti's Rien que les Heures of 26, Sigavetov's Man with a Movie Camera of 29, Joris Ethan's and forgive my horrible Dutch, Rechen, Rain of 29, and Jean Vigo's Upper Nice of 1930. Now these city symphonies, um, most of them follow the course of the day in the life of a city. Like the one-day novels of the period, uh, most notably among them, Joyce's Ulysses and Wolf's Mrs. Dalloway, um, 22 and 24 respectively, uh, they open up the question of modernist dailiness. The preoccupation with everyday life is combined with the intimation that much greater spans of time and culture are condensed within the diurnal round. Space and time relations and duration and the passing of time are central preoccupations of both films and novels. As Anne Banfield has, has argued of modernist fiction, the great modern novels of multiple viewpoints and moments set them ticking in the geography of the modern city. The crowded urban spaces become the obvious correlative of the multiplications of points of space-time in constant motion. The slowness of time Proust claims that the novel speeds up is there accelerated and made visible. For Paul Ricoeur, writing on the following in his time and narrative, what is significant is the relation that characters establish with the markers or measurers of time. In the streets, Banfield writes, the private worlds are in motion relative to one another. It is a post-relativity world. Each has its own clock, keeping its own time. Experienced time is also slowed down by the magnification of its smallest units, the day, the moment. Arrested moments punctuate the novels of the city, though this isn't an escape from time. Modernist time passes through arrested moments. Time and the marking of time was at the heart of Wolfe's conception of Mrs. Dalloway. The first draft, The Hours, used the structure of The Hours to measure out the day in very precise terms. In early notes, she wrote, Hours, 10, 11, 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 1, 2. 11 o'clock strikes. This is the aeroplane hour, which covers both Septimates and Retzia in Regent's Park and Clarissa's reflections, which lead to 12 o'clock, interview with specialist. The revised novel, Mrs. Dalloway, played down the hours and loosened the tight chronological structure, though 11 a.m. remains a central temporal juncture in this text, and one in which time seems to stand still, a reference almost certainly in this post-World War I text to the commemoration of Armistice Day from 1919 onwards at 11 o'clock on the 11th day of the 11th month there was a two-minute silence and a cessation of activity. The revised novel also reduced the critical perspectives of Peter and Rexia, Clarissa and Septimus were drawn forward and are united formally by the passing of time, by the rhythmic movements of their minds and by their common preoccupation with death. In the famous opening section of the novel, the life of the city is celebrated, in part through Mrs. Dalloway's consciousness, in people's eyes, in the swing, tramp and trudge, in the bellow and the uproar, the carriages, motor cars, omnibuses, vans, sandwichmen shuffling and swinging, brass bands, barrel organs, 
in the triumph and the jingle and the strange high singing of some aeroplane overhead was what she loved. Life, London, this moment of June. In this symphony of a city, pedestrians and vehicles alike become caught up in the rhythms of urban existence, the crowded dance of modern life, as a phrase from one of Wolf's essays has it. From her early essay, Street Music of 1905 onwards, Wolf had used the imagery of dance and rhythm to describe the orchestration of movement within the city. The relationship between the apparently disordered maelstrom of the city and the syncopation of urban rhythms bears not only on the ways in which art gives formal order to the flux and welter of perceptions and mental impressions, but is linked to the relationship between individual and group consciousness and motion, which Wolf explored in Mrs. Dalloway. Her tunneling process allowed her to move her characters around London while pulling them back into their pasts and timing their movements in ways that would create the impression of disparate events occurring simultaneously. The incidents of literary and filmic city symphonies in the 20s, and there are, of course, earlier and later examples, has been an important factor in making the connections between literature and cinema in this period. Mrs. Dalloway and Ulysses, when set alongside the seminal film in this context, Richmond's Berlin, seem to produce representations which cut across the divide between the two media. The intimation, as in Vertov's Man with a Movie Camera, that the city in the early morning might function as an image of the unconscious, and that the relationship between sleep and waking might correlate to the interplay between stasis and motion in the film medium. The charting of the city is awakening into life, blinds and doors opening, the movement of travel and transport around the city, the use of the reflective surfaces of the modern city, glass culture, display windows, the cinema itself, to mirror and to double the perceiving subject, the rhythmic orchestration of motion into pattern. For Alfred de Blin, author of Berlin Alexanderplatz, Joyce's Ulysses had shown the extent to which cinema had penetrated the sphere of literature, quote, Newspapers must become the most important, most broadly disseminated form of written testimony, everybody's daily bread. To the experiential image of a person today also belongs the streets, the scenes changing by the second, the signboards, automobile traffic. A part of today's image is the disconnectedness of man's activity, of his existence as such, the fleeting quality, the restlessness. In this account, modernist literature now contained had been penetrated by cinematic vision, which Dublin defines without using the term through a model of montage. While we associate literature structured around diurnal time in the city with modernist aesthetics, it has a significant, though largely forgotten, precedent in a work by the Victorian journalist George Augustus Sala, S-A-L-A, -A, twice around the clock or the hours of the day and night in London. This was first published in serial form in 1858, each weekly instalment being devoted to one of the hours, and as a book in 1859. He begins the day, a day in June, at 4 a.m. in Billingsgate Fish Market, simply because 4 a.m. is in reality the first hour of the working London day. The giant is wide awake at midnight. He sinks into a fitful slumber about two in the morning. Short is his rest, for at four he is up again and at work the busiest bee in the world's hive. And Sala closes it the following morning with the hour 3 a.m., a masked ball and the police station. Through the course of the 24 hours, Sala leads the reader to markets, London institutions, the Times newspaper offices, banks, the law courts, parliament, to public spaces, clubs, shops, theatres, railway stations, parks, and into domestic streets and homes where the organ grinders and ragged musicians gathered to produce their cacophonous street music. In the opening sections, or hours, Sala describes a form of city symphony beginning his first hour, 4 a.m., with the different pitches of London's church bells sounding out the hour, moving at 5 a.m. to the publication of the Times newspaper. He writes, it is a pulsation of London's mighty heart that should not be neglected and has a louder bell than all the others. For though the sides of the bell are only paper, the clapper is the great public tongue. The booming sun that fills the city every morning, and to use the words of Mr. Walter Whitman, utters its barbaric yoop over the housetops of creation, 
is the great public voice. This is the city of commerce, the money economy in Georg Zimmel's term, display, public opinion, locomotion, and great piles of printed paper organized by and within diurnal time. The forward momentum of Sala's text is that of the movement of the hours and the accumulated energies of the day. Yet it is striking that in his 8 o'clock a.m. chapter, St. James's Park and the Mall, Sala is drawn to the pull of past time, conjuring up ghosts and what he calls footstep memories. Two cities, London and Paris, are, he claimed, so haunted by impalpable ghosts of the traces of famous deeds that locomotion to one of my temperament becomes a task very slow, if not painfully difficult, of accomplishment. Locomotion here refers not only to the act of walking, but to narrative digression and progression, narrative as paric basis and excursion. As his hours proceed, Sala, as narrator and guide, takes on the identity of, in his term, a chronological Asmodeus. Asmodeus, a demon figure in early biblical and mythological representations, and frequently defined there as the demon of lust, became in later representations a more benign and satirical figure, amongst whose powers was the ability to lift the roofs of houses in order to reveal the private lives therein. Sala defined the complexities of his own role in this way, quote, how can I hope, I reiterate, to give you anything like a complete picture of the doings in London while still the clock goes round? I might take one house and unroof it, one street and unpave it, one man and disclose to you the secrets of 24 hours of his daily and nightly life, but it is London in its entirety that I have presumed to time, forgetting, oh, egregious and insistent, that every minute over which the clock hand passes is as the shape of a wrist applied to a kaleidoscope, and that the whole aspect of the city changes with as magical rapidity. For the chronological Asmodeus, then, the passing of time turns the urban panorama into a kaleidoscope. Time alters the face of the city from moment to moment, and it is this temporary shifting, as well as the spatial city, that Sala must attempt to depict in words. The Asmodeus figure would be taken up in early accounts of the cinema, most strikingly in Hugo von Hoffmann's style of 1922 essay, Ersatz für die Trauma, translated into English as a substitute for dreams in 1924. Hoffman's style suggests that in the dreams of those whose restricted lives otherwise provided little in the way of imaginative resources, quote, everything was charged with meaning. The dark room behind the cellar stairs, an old barrel in the courtyard, half full of rainwater, the lumber chest, the door to the storeroom, the garret door, or that to the neighbor's house, through which someone came. Now, now the old lumber chest with its magical contents is once again thrown open through the motion picture. The motion picture reveals all that was before mysteriously hidden. It shows what was behind the impenetrable, cold facade of people's houses. Doors fly open, and we see the homes of the rich, the young girls' room, the lobbies of hotels. We peer into the robber's den and into the secret workroom of the alchemist. The motion picture is like the aerial journey with Asmodeus, who took off the roofs of houses and revealed many secrets. But there is something more than the mere satisfaction of oft-disappointed curiosity. A secret instinct is appeased, an instinct familiar to the dreamer of dreams. Dreams are facts, and with the endless spectacle of the motion picture, there is mingled a pleasant sort of self-deception. The fleeting shadows are like the ebb and flow of life. They are indeed the ebbs and flows of innumerable existences. The filmic city symphonies of the 20s and 30s largely eschew individual narratives in order to render the city as protagonist, but they also hint at the ebbs and flows of innumerable existences, or in Sala's words, the thousand little dramas that take place at each moment and hour of the day. Now, I want to show sequences from two of the city symphonies I've mentioned, Richmond's Berlin and Cavalcanti's Rien que les Heures, and I will show them with um, the soundtrack rather than talking through them. 
um, though I know this is going to make it a little longer than it would be. Um, but the Berlin particularly, um, this is a restored copy with a, um, a score by Edmund Meisel, which was written in collaboration with Rutman and was long, uh, had long been feared lost. So it's, it's good, I think, to listen to it with that rather than have me talking through it, which Rutman, I'm sure, would not have wanted. Um, so the sequence we're going to watch, um, the, the, if you've seen Berlin, you will know that it's divided into five acts of the city symphony, um, and hence the musical structure of the film and the importance of the score. Um, I'm not starting right at the beginning, so I will just tell you that we, um, the opening, and we see first an image of water, um, of motion as liquidity, which then, with, wa with waves then turning into the horizontal bars, abstract horizontal bars, um, familiar from Rutman's earlier abstract films, and until this point, he had been a maker of purely abstract films, the Opus 1, 2, 3, 4 series. Um, then the vertical uh, abstract bars become the uh, iron girders and rails of the railway. So what we're seeing here is abstraction uh, transmuting into uh, documentary realism. We switch then to the train moving through an empty dawn landscape and coming into the station, which is where um, I hope this is going to open.
on, just, just pull out some things that we might want to, uh, to think about here. The way that obviously clock time, uh, chronological time, becomes an ordering principle for the city's chaotic energies um, and the progression of the film from 5 a.m. Uh, through to the city of spectacle and show at night. The progression of the hours, and we see the clock at 5 a.m., 8 a.m., and 12, um, and 12 p.m., midday, sorry, gives coherence to the film's increasing use of unfamiliar angles and juxtapositions, and the increasingly hectic representation of city life. Thereafter, we may be assumed to have internalized the diurnal structure, though it seems likely that there were further time shots in the unedited film material. The sequence we've just watched, however, has a different aesthetic, showing us the city at dawn through a medium closer to photography than film, at least at the beginning, and giving us something like frozen time, or the arrested time to which I referred in discussing the modernist novel. This is an intimation of daybreak as the unconscious of the city, akin to the hypnagogic visions that occur between sleeping and waking, reinforced in the shots of the underside or underground of the city, as in Hoffman Stell's invocations of hidden or liminal spaces, the dark room behind the cellar stairs, an old barrel in the courtyard, half full of rainwater. The visual image of litter, or a sheet of newspaper, blowing along a street is a standard trope in city films. In Berlin, the motion of the paper is the only movement in the empty streets at the beginning of the day, and it connects the dailiness of the newspaper, or perhaps the advertising <coughs> hoarding, with a day in the life of a city theme. Siegfried Krakauer commented on the sites of refuse in what he called this garbage-minded film. Rutman's Berlin includes the wealth of sewer grates, gutters, and streets littered with rubbish, and he referred to the camera as a rag picker. The first human figure we see on the city streets is a single policeman with his dog. A little later, we will see two uniformed men. Policemen, and particularly traffic police, represent social order in the film. They become the conductors of the city symphony as they direct the traffic. And traffic lights were not introduced into, in Berlin in, until 1925. So Rutman's film, made over, the t over two years, was thus constructed at this transitional point. In this opening sequence, before the day's traffic has started up, the figures seem rather, however, to represent the question of number or quantity in the city, one policeman, two policemen. As towards the close of the sequence I showed, we see a single pipe-smoking worker joined by two others. The progression of the day is not only chronological, but cumulative, and the individual becomes the pair, the trio, and ultimately the mass or crowd. Modern time is not only chronological time, but to borrow Waichi Dimmock's term, numerical time, she writes, the guiding spirit is serial numbers, doubling as chronological dates. In this opening sequence, too, we see a cat following its independent course. Well, we see two cats, actually. Cats, crepuscular creatures, appear frequently in city symphonies as the eyes, lapped like the camera, see what or where no human subject can. And they live to a rather different daily rhythm. My son, who helped me put together the, download the clips from DVDs, onto this said, don't talk about the cat. <laughs> but he's not here, so I've talked about the cat. Okay. You would make me sound eccentric. Okay. <laughs> right. um, we also see a, a small group of people who are clearly returning from the previous night's party, the man trailing those balloons around the corner. Uh, the, the end of one day meets the beginning of the next. We see the awakening of the city from the closed blinds and shutters, the city's eyes, panning across to the mannequins in the shop window, who will, in later sequences, re-emerge in the form of automata of various kinds. And, of course, the mannequins and automata, beloved of surrealist filmmakers um, and writers. The doors that open without human intervention anticipate the machine activities that compose much of the film's subject, an industry which functions largely as the film represents it, without human labour. The movement of the train circles back to the film's opening and to cinema's own origins, most famously in the Lumiere's uh, 1895 arrival of a train, reminding us that this film is returning to cinema sources in documentary and actuality, but now with the angles and vortices of avant-garde aesthetics. Now the next film I'm going to show, another same length of time, is from Cavalcanti, 
um, we are going to say nothing but the hours or nothing but time, um, and I'll show it and then say a little bit about it.
Hoffman apparently saw Cavalcanti's film before making Berlin. Uh, there are clear similarities, the following through of the hours of one day from early morning until late that night, as well as the interplay between the still and the moving image in the opening sequence, and the focus on the city's detritus and the organic or animal life that it sustains. Rianke Lezer, whose opening intertitle reads, as we've seen, this film does not need a story, it is no more than a series of impressions on time passing, represents a flow of life at which, in which, at intervals, the passing of the hours is indicated by close-ups of a clock a face, though unlike the clock in Berlin, it seems a curious, even surreal, blending of a 12-hour and a 24-hour clock. The surrealism, very apparent uh, in the sequence we've seen with the blinking eyes, recalling films by Man Ray at, uh, and others of this period, returns throughout the film, in which there is a constant interplay between revealed realities and constructed representations, and obviously other things to say about the, the film, that this opening sequence, the, the shift from painting to film um, becomes the, the shift from the still to the moving image. Um, the photograph which is torn up into an impossibly proliferating number of pieces, thus becoming both collage and litter. Um, and uh, th what I didn't, I uh, wasn't in a slightly later sequence, Cavalcanti's very extensive use of wipes um, rather than time-lapse photography uh, in which fresh food becomes uh, decaying and organic matter. There are also um, there are significant differences between uh, Rian and Berlin. Cavalcanti's social critique is much more emphatic than Rutman's, and the film introduces a narrative and dramatic dimension played out between a prostitute and her pimp, a sailor and a woman newspaper vendor whom the pimp murders, uh, a narrative element which is almost entirely absent from Berlin. Elliot Paul and Robert Sage, writing of, of Cavalcanti's film in the little magazine Transition, in an article entitled Artistic Improvements of the Cinema, wrote, in his Rianca Cavalcanti made a commendable effort to get away from the ancient hero and heroine tangle by composing a series of views of a city at successive hours of the day from dawn until late at night. The plot was merely the cycle of the day. The characters were the persons or scenes most representative of each hour. The style was the artistic personal touch which unmistakably accompanies the arrangement and photography of each picture by this producer. If the structure faltered, it was through the momentary introduction of an orthodox plot towards the middle. In relation to the orthodox plot, whose presence is critiqued here, however, one might note of the film that the characters, the prostitute, the newspaper vendor, etc., emerge out of the represented fragments of urban life, as, the, if, as if the materiality and mass of the city were producing them as contingent beings. And we, another figure that runs throughout the film, we saw here the old woman who does not know, we are told, the passing of time and is thus outside time. She is something the city has forgotten, a Beckettian and mythological figure staggering on her uneven course through the byways of the city. Paul and Sage close their account of the film with a claim that, although not completely satisfactory, Rianca Lezer was a preliminary demonstration that the cinema is capable of being under, own, under no obligations to literature, drama, or painting. The assertion relates to the need at this time to claim film as an autonomous aesthetic form, and it's one that arises with particular emphasis in the case of the city symphonies. As I've suggested, however, it could be argued that the filmic city symphonies are in fact in close relationship with modernist literary forms, an identity which was asserted by Ezra Pound when he wrote of Rutman's Berlin that it was in the movement, the movement to include his own poetics, as well as the writings of Joyce and John Rodker. One final point on the films before I move on. They appear much more in symbiosis with temporal progression and the markers of time than many of the avant-garde films of the period in which, as we've been hearing in many papers in this conference, time is destroyed or is the destroyer. The determinants for this relatively harmonious relationship with temporality include the City Symphony's commitment to projects of recording actuality and everyday life, an understanding of film as a time-based medium and an intuition of the innate dimensions of what would become to known in the later 20th century 
but which was being explored extensively in the laboratories of the early 20th century as circadian rhythm, the biological rhythms of the day and of daily time. Now, I'm going to move on to the last second last part of the paper where I'm focusing on a rather different kind of city text, an early publication from the mass observation movement, The Anthropology of Ourselves, founded in Britain in 1937, which set out to record and archive the phenomena and experience of everyday life. I'm looking, focusing on one particular text, um, the May 12, 1937 survey, which was published as Mass Observation Day Survey and edited by Humphrey Jennings and Charles Madge, two of the movement's founders. And I, um, I'm going to skip over this film, though it is one of, I think it is my favorite film, actually. Um, but I'm skipping over it. Okay, so on our left there, we have Madge and the other founder, um, the anthropologist, Tom Harrison. On the right there, looking dreamy, is the filmmaker and poet, Humphrey Jennings. So the May 12th survey, um, which I've got a picture of on the right there, um, edited by Jennings and Madge, was a contribution to documentary aesthetics as radical, I would argue, as those of the city symphonies. The mass observation movement, whose foundations were in part in surrealism and whose original working name was popular poetry, would become, in only a few years, a government-sponsored project to gather the public opinion. The involvement of Jennings, poet, painter, and filmmaker was short-lived, though the impulses of the early years of mass observation towards the documentary poetics remained at the heart of Jennings' films. The May 12, 1937 uh, survey was a record of an extraordinary day, um, the, uh, that of the coronation of, of King George VI following the abdication crisis when um, his brother Edward VIII um, stepped it down from, from, the, the, from the throne. Humphrey Jennings' film vision clearly helped shape its organisation and its optics. The, the published text uh, uses the techniques of montage and collage to create effects of juxtaposition, fragmentation and diversity, while also assessing the significance of a common perspective. The form of the text enacts a vision of mass consciousness as diverse and capable of resolution into a single narrative whole, but is linked in complex, underlying ways through collective images, <coughs> mass wishes, and mass fears. At no point does it attempt to give a single clear image of the actual coronation ceremonies, staying instead with the partial perspectives of its observers. And these were divided into a number of different kinds, which I'll be brief about. There were observers who were asked to make um, uh, give accounts of um, what they did on May the 12th. Uh, they did, then, secondly, the thousands of leaflets were distributed to the general public with questions including, what did you do on May the 12th? Give a short hour-by-hour hour description of your day. And thirdly, in the editor's words, a mobile squad of 12 observers was set to work to confer on happenings in the streets of London from midnight on May the 11th till after midnight on May 12th. They worked in shifts and kept in touch with the mass observation headquarters by telephone, like the reporters and a newspaper office. During the time they were working, they took notes almost continuously and from their notes wrote up lengthy reports. The editors continue. By these three methods, three kinds of focus were obtained, not to mention the individual differences of focus between each of the observers. Close up and long shot, detail and ensemble were all provided. Some recorded just what reached the threshold of a normal consciousness. Others, by concentrated effort, saw and heard far more than they were normally accustomed to. On the whole, the excitement of the day seems to have stimulated most people's powers of observation to an unusual degree. And something I really haven't gone into here, which is the question of the relationship between the ordinary day and the extra extraordinary day of Diana literature. <coughs> Chapter two of the day survey, London on May 12th, takes its place alongside the city films and fictions of the period. The photographer Humphrey Spender recalled the impact of seeing Rutman's Berlin at the Film Society in London, describing it as, quote, an early documentary produced with hidden cameras in 1928, it was in fact um, brought out a year earlier, which certainly had a formative influence on me. It is significant that Spender note, noted the hidden cameras rather than other innovative aspects of the film. 
including the use, as we've seen, of still or stilled photographic images, which halt the flow of the city and create a continuum between the new photography and the cinema of the Weimar period. Spender's focus on the unseen camera relates to his own sense of his own photography as that of the unobserved observer, to be differentiated perhaps from mass observations project of the observation of everyone, by everyone, including themselves. Spender isn't in the frame and was uneasy about staged photographs, uh, or those in which the subject was unaware of the camera, and I'll show you some photographs in a, in a moment. The optic of May the 12th, by contrast, was highly self-reflexive, with the omniscient periscopes and mirrors reflecting viewers back to themselves as often as they transmitted the scene. I keep seeing myself and looking quickly away, as one observer wrote of their attempts to use a periscope to view the spectacle. <clears throat> in May 12th, observer CM1, who gives his code name, this is in fact Humphrey Jennings, gives an account of a camera shooting pictures, which itself enacts the frame by frame sequencing of film. Apsley Gate, 314, a huge burst of cheers, GB camera <coughs> focuses, that's Gaumont British, uh, turns over the lens turret, gets his eye to the viewfinder and his left hand on the panning handle, shoots. He turns the turret over again, looks through, turns back, shoots. Next unscrews telephoto lens, a, ba a band comes playing down the drive. He turns over again, has a look, pans to a new position. There is a rush of people forward and cheering. 3.20, he turns back, comes back to viewfinder and shoots. 3.21, he opens the camera door to see the film is not jamming, shuts it, shoots again, loud clapping. He turns over, tilts right down, has a look, turns back, shoots. He swings the camera right round to have a look at the front of the lens and back again, the umbrella revolving with the camera. He turns over, looks back, shoots. This is prose and acting camera movement and it suggests that the writer of the passage would indeed like to be in the position of the cameraman focusing and shooting. It is all about looking, looking through, having a look, though the look is swallowed up by the camera apparatus itself. We are only indirectly shown the perspectives of the cameraman on the scene, either through his eyes or the lens. He, like the cameraman in Zygavertov's man with a movie camera, whom we see carrying his camera and his tripod around the city, sometimes towering over it, seems at times to become at one with his machine, the heroic Kino Eye. It is so, of some significance, I'd argue, that Jennings chose to focus on the Gaumont British cameraman filming the events for a newsreel. The televising of the 1937 coronation was the most ambitious transmission to date, the first attempt to use remote relay, and the first use of Emitron so-called cameras, which were filmless optical electronic devices making possible direct, and in the claim of the BBC director, practically instantaneous transmission. The coming of television thus redefined mediated actuality, presentness and presence, with film now become the past. May 12th was an inaugural event for both mass observation and broadcast television. Mass observation's organisation of its observers and its transmission of the day's events both emulated and was in competition with the BBC's televising and its networking of London through Emitron cameras and cables, radio transmitters, vision and sound control vans and control rooms. The Emitron cameras were located at Apsley Gate, Hyde Park Corner, which was also the location for the Gaumont British cameraman, film cameraman, whose shooting, who shooting Jennings was describing. The cameraman, quote, opens the camera door to see the film is not jamming. You've got that in the extract. It's a detail which makes the precise point that this is a camera with film and not a television camera, and that it is on this film that the day's events will be recorded as the mass observers will record their observations through the equally durable and arguably equally fragile medium of paper. Instantaneity thus becomes of less significance than record. If May the 12th was informed by a predominantly filmic vision, made more complex by a simultaneous emulation of and resistance to the newly televisual, 
the optic of the later mass observation um, project and publication would seem to be primarily that of photography, though, as I've suggested, the German modernist film work, which had a profound influence on Humphrey Spender, blurs the divide between photography and film. And I'll say something just very briefly about uh, the 1943 publication, The Pub and the People, which was a survey of um, pub going and drinking habits in the northern English city of Bolton, known to the mass observers as Worktown. And it was to have um, Humphrey spending, Spender's photographs um, included, but they're not actually in the text. Here we are. Um, and the, the actual publication was very substantially the work of John Summerfield, author of the 1936 novel May Day, the conception for which had come when Summerfield, returning by boat from New York and coming up the Thames, had seen dawn break over London, the panoramic view of the sleeping city, giving him both his novel's structure and its opening section. The action of May Day takes place over 48 hours, leading up to a day of militant protest. The novel would seem strongly indebted to John Dos Passos's Manhattan Transfer, in its turn a homage to Joyce's Ulysses, and May Day also has strong affinities with Graham Greene's most intentionally filmic novel, It's a Battlefield of 34. All these novels are connected by their engagement with cinematic forms of representation and film's way of seeing, and in the case of Greene's novel, of hearing and overhearing in ways which are closely connected to a number of the mass observation texts. There is a particular focus on time in the pub and the people. Drinking becomes perceived as essentially a time-based activity. The obsession with time among the, the mill workers, who never escape from time, even on their breaks from work, is especially strange, we're told, to the several painters and poets who have worked with us on angles of work time observation and the painters and poets included um, William Empson, um, Julian Trevelyan, and, Will and William Goldstream. And I can't go into now the hilarity and sense of these young men from London sitting in the corner of the pub, timing the workers drinking, um, and saying it is very important that no one sees what we're doing. Okay. Um, anyway, to time. The last hour of the night and the last day of the week and of the drinking peaks. And one aspect of drinking is that it is an attempt to escape from time, to change the rhythm of living, the speed of thinking. This temporal focus takes us not only back to the city symphonies, to time and film in the city, but to Humphrey Jennings' film Spare Time, whose focus on workers' leisure also opens up the question of the spare. The representation in what is left over is to be found not only in the emphasis on waste and detritus, in the May 12th survey, um, this is, uh, I, won't, I won't go into here, but you see an area of black mud string with pieces of torn newspaper, and at the bottom there, this is again Jennings, and this is exactly what his later film documentaries would be doing, this extraordinary <coughs> level of sound and vision, fanfare, prelude to the choir, reproduction of music, excellent drowning the sound of rustling paper under people's feet round and turned by the crunch of the guard's feet, Waterloo steps covered with torn newspapers and broken bottles. Um, I'll just go through the back to work time people. Okay, so the, uh, what is to be waste and detritus, um, litter, broken bottles and old newspapers, but also in mass observations, fascination with dreams as representations of, in the translation of Freud's term, the day's residues, or to translate it a little differently, and perhaps more sympathetically, the remains of the day. The London section of the May 12th survey ends with the streets of empty apart from one very drunk little middle-aged man with a bowler hat in his hand, singing God Save the King, words drawn out as long as they will bear. In a later section of the text, the focus turns to the residuum of the day, now we can look at some incidents which have this surprising or disturbing quality, they write, including a number of recorded dreams. They represent, in fact, that residuum of the day, which at present defeats precise analysis or explanation, but which is important as giving it its dominant tone or character, a character which is made up of the totality of the fantasy and image-making of all the individuals. All the projects of everyday life which I've been discussing point up the complexities of daily time. 
The forward drive of linear chronological time is pulled back by footstep memories. Continuous images are slowed or stalled into still frames or photographs. Time is arrested or hollowed out by its intervals. The residuum of the day is represented in the dream. The present is shadowed, or in Virginia Woolf's term, backed by the past. While the diurnal or circadian novel and film have become closely identified with modernist aesthetics, they've had important afterlives in more recent and contemporary literary and cultural practice. In the literary sphere, and I'm only naming Anglo-American texts here, and if people have other examples, European examples, from, from the modern period, I'd be extremely grateful to hear about them. We have novels by Christopher Isherwood, Saul Bellow, Don DeMillo, Ian McEwan, John Lanchester, and others. In the visual arts, there are significant works by artists including Douglas Gordon and Christian Marclay. Using video technology, Gordon in his Psycho 24 projected Hitchcock's Psycho at two frames a second so that the entire film takes 24 hours to run. Gordon has commented thus of time and sequence in the work. What interests me about the 24-hour psycho is that it runs so slowly that you can never know what's going to happen next. The past is a confusion of memory. The images follow each other too slowly for you to remember. The past goes on and the future never happens, so everything stays in the present. And the present is a constant conversion of convergence of future and past. As Heidegger says, it doesn't really exist. In Gordon's account, the film works with his interest in those areas where perception breaks up or breaks down. Things that have lost their allocated place can be observed and judged freely. Christian Marclay's The Clock is a film which montages time-related sequences, shots of clocks, watches, or references in dialogue to time from thousands of films to compose the 24 hours of his own film. The installation works, and it would be started if it were being shown in a gallery space at 5 um, p.m., so that the time shown in the film matches the time at which it's being watched. It enables us, in this powerful instance, we are able to reflect on the ways in which time functions in cinema, and more broadly, in, in which, the ways in which time and temporality are at once experienced and represented. And I'm just going to show if I can a very short solution. It would be useless. No one cares what we have to say. Hundreds of small craft, led by six fire tanks making fountains of water, formed an escort flotilla and four WASP helicopters flew past its loot. In the city, the financial times ordinary share index was down 10 points an hour ago at 529.8. BBC Radio News. Oh my God, we made it. Well done, Charles. Knew you wouldn't let me down. God, that was close. Can't stand it ticking about my heart. Ah. Mm -hmm. 
think of a lot of it. I'm here to hold me. You've been in the bar. Look here, Mr. Hussey.